I'm sure, he is the author of uh, what I will modestly call one of the greatest works of history ever written, The Making of the English Working Class, published in 1963. Thompson was uh, a leading figure in the rise of social history, in the rise of what we call history from below, or people's history, which emphasized the capacity of working people to shape the course of history. Thompson wrote numerous other works. He was a poet as well as a novelist. Uh, he was an activist in some ways above all else. One thing I'd like to emphasize for tonight is that he was a member of a group, an extremely influential group, formed shortly after World War II in Britain called the Communist Party Historians Group. This small group produced some of the greatest historians of the 20th century. Edward Thompson was one, Christopher Hill was another, Eric Hobsbawm was a third. I'm proud to say that Hill and Hobsbawm have both lectured in this series. And there were many other distinguished people, Dorothy Thompson, for example, uh, Victor Kiernan. It's, a, it's an extremely important group. Well, when Edward Thompson died in 1993, his longtime colleague Eric Hobsbawm had this to say. He said, Edward was the person who when he studied any subject at all, could always find something new and original to say. I think that's true. I think Thompson wrote with tremendous imaginative power when he wrote history. He had the power not only to reinterpret a given subject, but literally to transform it beneath your very eyes and to change the angle at which you would look at it. And you would never see it the same way again. That's the kind of writer he was. That's the kind of intellectual he was. Now, I think Peter Linebaugh is a very similar kind of person, a very similar kind of historian. Peter is, I think, in my view, one of the most creative people writing history today, anywhere. And this I know because I worked with him. We wrote a book together called The Many-Headed Hydra. He's also the author of what I regard as a classic, The London Hang, Crime and Civil Society in the 18th Century, and now he's the author of the Magna Carta Manifesto. I think it's this ability to see things in a new way that makes Peter such an unusual historian. It's the kind of thing that made Robin Kelly, another previous speaker in this series, say, there is not a more important historian living today, period. So it is with great joy that I introduce and bring to the stage my friend, Julian Barclay. He's the editor of a new magazine of socialist humanism. Well, he was making an assumption about Montgomery, Sapolsky, and White. The assumption was that labor historians were naturally interested in humanism. And that's because he did not come from a tradition where labor was regarded as a subfield. He came from a tradition where labor was the basis of human creativity. So it's entirely natural that the labor historians would assent to this notion of humanism. And he also made an assumption about me and about this journal that I was editing. We had this journal 
called Zero Work. <laughs> uh, I didn't uh, really have the nerve to show it to him, to tell you the truth. Because <laughs> it wasn't socialist, it wasn't humanist, and I hadn't finished my dissertation. <laughs> Anyway, we were beginning to look into identity politics back then. And at first, anyway, uh, they renounced the universalist claims of humanism. Self-activity was our watchword and autonomy. And anyway, when you got to it, Edward was kind of a confused fellow in terms of identities. Never quite sure what to call himself. When I first met him, he told me, Pete, uh, C. Wright Mills, you should call me Ed. I'd like you to do that, too. I could never bring myself to do it. He grew up being called Palmer, named after his mother. His mother was American, very proud of her New England heritage. He included the Palmers who came over from England as uh, poor nailers from the east end of London in the second ship from England that came here, the Fortune, after the Mayflower. So Edward grew up being called Palmer. His dad was called Edward, Edward Thomas. There's some confusion, so maybe that's the reason. But Edward went off to war in 1941, and he wrote back from North Africa that he wanted to be called Edward. His brother preceded him in the war, his brother Frank. His mom was disappointed, and uh, his dad was too. I'm just trying to say he had a problem with identity. He was both American and English, and he was always not remaking himself, but conscious of who he was and what he stood for. His wife, Dorothy, when he wasn't around, called him Sir. He never was knighted. His history was poetic, it was epic, and expre it expressed a vast yearning. And he understood human nature as having been made by labor, but he saw in it a vast potential. He thought our nature wasn't completed yet. He believed we had a ways to go. He expressed a revolutionary affirmative. And his rhetorical brilliance, his sustained metaphors, his ironic tone, his passionate cries, his awkwardness, his vulnerabilities, his multiple voices, were alive very closely to archival rummaging and to his intellectual striving. I want to say that right away, Marcus, in light of your very kind introduction. He was a historian. He didn't find or see things so much as find them out, as to discover them. They're already there if we only had the eyes to see. And this is why we left a lecture with him somewhat different than when we went in, because he showed us things about ourselves that we hadn't seen before. And this is my ambition tonight. My lecture is called The Constitution and the Commons. And it's some social history with a politics put back in. In 1985, uh, so, my work has been inspired by Edward Thompson, and I may talk about him too much tonight. Because, mm -hmm. In 1985, he looked back on his past as a radical social historian. And he looked back with a certain distance, because he'd been out of the history business for a while, trying to bring about a peace movement. 
You know that peace sign. That was him. He said a certain breakthrough in British radical history associated particularly at that point in the Marxist tradition took place some 45 years ago. He said he apologized for using the military imagery. We are still exploiting the terrain that was opened up with that breakthrough. So he took the breakthrough that Marcus referred to and he put it not in 1945, but he put it in the year 1940. He was 16 years old at the time. He was a schoolboy at a boarding school in Bristol that was a target of Nazi bombing. So in that summer, as the bombing began, the school children of the school were removed from Bristol and he was sent to Leicester, Leicestershire in the middle of England. Millions of children that summer and in that fall left their homes in this class-ridden society, workers in the slums of the cities, and moved into the countryside. And there was a mixture of the classes and of the people that had never happened before. And Edward, at the age of 16, his brother, already gone off to war, was part of that movement. England was a class society. One-sixth of the children did not have shoes in 1940. An upper class boy or girl was on average four inches taller than someone from the working class, the vast majority of British people. Now, breakthroughs in that summer were happening all over the world. Virginia Woolf, you know, the great feminist, had two houses in Bloomsbury that were smashed to bits from the bombs. She was denied a place at the conference table or at the officer's mess as a woman. She found her place at the kitchen table. And she wrote, thinking is my fighting. That was the, her breakthrough in 1940. On the 11th of September, 1940, she wrote in her diary, fearful of the invasion to come. Mary Inman in the United States had a breakthrough in the summer of 1940 when she proposed that those whose work is never done, that that part of the human race who works 24 hours a day for love, not money, be paid. Mary Inman was her name. She advocated wages for housework. What a breakthrough. That same summer, 1940, C.L.R. James, the Trinidadian intellectual, sports writer, playwright, novelist, essayist, he said to the white ruling class across the Atlantic that history must be rewritten to show how, in the transition from feudalism to capitalism, that great labor was conducted by African Americans. What a breakthrough that was. And then, in the 1940s, it's been so often quoted in the previous, in our, in our time, Walter Benjamin tried to escape Europe by crossing the Pyrenees, escaped from the, the fascist armies, the Blitzkrieg, and he handed in Marseille, in the Marseille underground, over to Hannah Arendt, his theses on history. And he said, history is a flower, and it must be brushed against the grain. Not even the dead are safe from the enemy. The now is shot through with messianic time, Benjamin said in 1940. 
I'm trying to build up the pressure of that year, 1940, to understand Edward's breakthrough. For me, he said, 1940, as a school student, came from the work of Christopher Hill. His first brief study of 1640. I sat down at the age of 16 to write a sixth form history society, a paper on the Marxist interpretation of history and the English Civil War. And he relied on Christopher Hill's study of the English Civil War. A study that proposed that the Civil War be called the English Revolution. A study that showed that revolution was not a cheap politician's slogan, but it meant the living struggle of comrades to build a society based on communal ownership. Now this was not Stalinist history. This was not orthodox communist history. And no wonder. You remember, 1940, or perhaps you've read, that at that time, the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany, leaving communists, who until that time took their direction very much from the Soviet Union, on their own. And this freed Christopher Hill to begin thinking of the English Revolution, not in Soviet terms, but in English terms, if I may uh, put it that way. And Dona Tor, the founder of the Communist Party history group after the war, in 1940, had her breakthrough. When she wrote that millions of people who stood outside of history have become makers of history in India, in Africa, in Latin America. These are the breakthroughs of 1940, and in particular, this breakthrough in the communist tradition. Edward went off to war. In his knapsack, he carried one book. It's called The Handbook of Freedom. And its introduction has a beautiful rendition on the meaning of the word commons. After the war, Edward took this book with him when he went north to teach in adult education classes. And it led him to new sources and to researches of his own. So I think in a very definite and particular way, we can see the making going right back through the, the making of the English working class, through the 50s, through the 40s, right into the summer of 1940. These are some of his breakthroughs. And the tags by which we know him today, his moralism, his belief in human agency, his belief in his way of cutting through academic BS, the multiculturalism, that led that, that version of multiculturalism that turned into gobbledygook of post-structural linguistic acrobatics. <laughs> Observed by fewer and fewer. He cut through it all with a great knife of history, and he said, we are speaking, I speak of human experience. I think Aesop, the ancient storyteller, the slave storyteller, was able to tell his stories because he knew of human experience as an experience of suffering. And he, had, he said that it's death that gives the historian their license. Also in 1940, one of Elizabeth Bowen's characters in a story she wrote said, now there's enough death to challenge being alive. We're facing it anyway that we don't live. We're confronted by the impossibility of living unless we can break through into something else. 
She's writing in the midst of war. There's so much death around her, it, it causes her to think, how am I living? What am I doing in my life? And the blitz over London, the fires, caught, brought this to her mind. And she saw a vast illumination that destroyed the darkness that she was living in. And it's this urgency that she expressed that I began to feel after the 11th of September, 2001. You remember Joan Didion said in her reaction to the slaughter of the Twin Towers and the subsequent lie, she spoke of the troublingly belligerent idealization of historical ignorance that she found around her in North America, in the United States, in the reaction to 9-11. And the conservative intellectuals had prepared us, Alan Bloom, Gertrude Himmelfarb, for this historical ignorance. Search the American mind by Bloom for the word Magna Carta, and you will be on a futile task. Search Gertrude Himmelfarb in her books on Victorian England for the phrase, the freeborn Englishman, and you will be on a futile task. You will not find Magna Carta, habeas corpus, the prohibition of torture, due process of law in the work of these conservative intellectuals writing about the, quote, Anglo-Protestant tradition. I mention this because I want to let, well, I, I won't play games here. Because what happened to me in October 2001 as a scholar is that I was listening, had my television on, and was listening to President Bush address two houses of the United States Congress. And he invited Prime Minister Tony Blair over to listen. And he said, we are fighting for freedom. You remember? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and I waited, and I waited, I waited for somebody, somebody, some white hair, some old soldier who would remember, who would remember that there are four freedoms. If you're going to compare Tony Blair to Winston Churchill, if you're going to compare yourself to Franklin Roosevelt, if you're going to bring up, conjure up World War II, what did they call it, the great generation? Or what was that expression? Then at least you can give us the four freedoms. But nobody had remembered because they had passed memory was gone, and before my ears and eyes, history was being rewritten. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, but the other four freedoms of World War II, of 1940, of the breakthrough of 1940, were not expressed. It was on the 6th of January, 1941, that Franklin Roosevelt summarized what he had learned from the Battle of written while the bombs were still falling, before Coventry had been bombed. He was summarizing why are the democracies fighting? And he summarized it in a State of the Union uh, address as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom from fear, and freedom from want. It's those two from freedoms that George Bush refused to name. And then Franklin Roosevelt, uh, two weeks later, gave his third inaugural address. And he wrote that the spirit, the faith of America, is the product of centuries. Well, I wish I could talk like he talked. It was born in the multitudes of those who came from many lands, some of high degree, but mostly plain people who sought here, early and late, 
define freedom more freely. The democratic aspiration, Franklin Roosevelt is teaching, is no mere recent phrase in history. It is human history. It perme permeated the ancient life of early peoples. It blazed anew in the Middle Ages. It was written in Magna Carta. He said, in the midst of this buildup to the US entry to the war, in the midst of the destruction of Europe, with only England left, he says, in the midst of swift happenings, it's time to pause for a moment and to take stock, to recall what our place in history has been, and to rediscover what we are and what we may be. If we do not, we risk the real peril of isolation. You see, he's saying if we forget our past, then we are isolationists. He's not saying if we forget the other countries in the world, we're isolationists. Interesting, isn't it? Of course, they're linked. He wants us in the third inaugural to remember Magna Carta. And then a few weeks later, in 1941, he wrote, or he spoke to the White House correspondents. He said, I spoke of four freedoms. Uh, they may not be immediately attainable throughout the world, but humanity does not move forward toward those glorious ideals through democratic processes. And if we fail, if democracy is superseded by slavery, In 1941, the most advanced technological machines in the world, the V2, V1 rockets, are being produced by slave labor in the Hartz Mountains at the time that Roosevelt was speaking. Slavery is not an idle rhetorical expression in 1941. It's a worldwide phenomenon. And slave masters have overrun Europe. And if we fail, if democracy is superseded by slavery, then those four freedoms, or even the mention of them, will become forbidden things. So that's what I took from 1940 in 2001. That's what we must take. Let's pause ourselves. George Bush in October. 1941 is able to lie to us and say to deny two of the four freedoms and have us off to war in Afghanistan. The dogs of war are yapping into Iraq. And meanwhile, I wonder what is Magna Carta? What is freedom from want. In February 1940, you Sunday afternoon turn on the radio, kick back before the rat race begins again on Monday, listen to CBS, they got a program called The Pursuit of Happiness. You might have heard of it, uh, Paul Robeson. Uh, in January 1940, sang the ballad of the Americans. In February 1940, Kurt Weill and Maxwell Anderson, they sang the ballad of Magna Carta. A week later, Woody Guthrie wrote his song, This Land is Your Land. This Land is My Land. These are the breakthroughs of 1940. Magna Carta was agreed to, so now, Al, I come to the robber barons. Magna, <laughs> Magna Carta was agreed to in June 1215 in England. Bad King John, he was the robber baron. He went around pulling the teeth from Jews, one tooth a week in 
until they gave him all their money. He went around taking people's forest lands. He would take your cart for himself. Magna Carta was an armistice ending a civil war. It was a kind of a social contract between church and monarchy, between king and barons, between the individual and the state, between town and country, between Christian and Jew, between husband and wife, between common and privatizing. And during an era of worldwide competition for commodity trade in the Mediterranean, and of Christian crusades against the Islam and Jewish infidels of Jerusalem, it was part of the process of centralizing monarchy, centralizing a war machine. And it was also a time of the birth of the bourgeoisie in Europe, and of vast heretical movements. Magna Carta has 63 chapters. It used to be that the 39th chapter was known by every school child. That's the most well-known. You'll find it in old courthouses. Perhaps some of you had to take Latin, will remember it. It's the one from which habeas corpus is derived. It's the one from which the prohibition of torture is derived. It's the one that provides for trial by jury. It's the one that has the expression due process of law. These four provisions of Magna Carta were systematically not forgotten and destroyed after 2001. Hey, you can run a good seminar based on these 63 chapters. I'm not saying it's going to be amusing and entertaining. <laughs> but by the time those two hours is up in your seminar, and you've gone around the room, everyone reading one of the chapters, they're very short, you know, a line or two, and commented on it and tried to figure out what it's meant, you'll have a very good grounding. And you will not be isolationist in the way that Franklin Roosevelt was fearful that we'd become. It's just a tip. <laughs> Me and Mike Ratner started talking about it a few years ago of the Center for Constitutional Rights. And now the Supreme Court is talking and remembering Magna Carta. And it's thanks to Michael Ratner, who got the pro bono work from the corporate firms to take on the Guantanamo cases. We've yet to deal with torture. We've yet to deal with snooping. We've yet to deal Let me get back to the story. The robber baron, bad King John, he had his fingers crossed. As soon as he got out of there, running meat, it is, it's an island on the River Thames. I don't know if you can see the cover to this book. But here on the right side is bad King John, the king of the robber barons. To get to the place on the Thames where he had to agree to Magna Carta, some worker took him over there. Here's his over on the left. You can see this fantastic mural over in the old Cuyahoga County Courthouse building in Cleveland. When you're driving out to the Midwest, further in the Midwest, or driving out to the West Coast, stop there in Cleveland. Have a look. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Joan, it puts the workers right there. All right? In memory of the homestead workers. <laughs> Where was I? Yes, he reneged on it as soon as he got out of there and the Pope backed him up. Civil war began again. And the Magna Carta was lost. Bad King John dropped dead. And here's the story of how he died. As the peasants told it to themselves a century later, and as William Morris remembered it, and I learned it from William Morris. King John was riding along, oppressing his people, with a huge train of baggage, which got lost when the tide came up in a place on the English coast called the Wash. His luggage got lost in the Wash. <laughs> <laughs> he was cold and infuriated. He went to the nearest abbey. Open up! And they opened up and said, here's a robe. Come down by the fire and we'll make you dinner, sire. And he said, he bellowed out, how 
much is this loaf of bread? They said, it's one penny, Simon. Well, before I'm finished, it'll be worth 12 pence. And at that point, there was a young monk nearby who considered to himself that his time had come. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. Would you like dessert? And the monk went out into the orchard and plucked a plum and then another. He took out the pits and put venom inside instead. He brought the plums back to his majesty, who looked at him cunningly and said, you eat first, monk. And so the monk ate. And then the king ate. The monk turned blue and perished on the floor. King did the same. And that was the end of that King John. Suicide bombing, see? <laughs> <laughs> and the plums are from the Middle East. <laughs> They're not indigenous to England. They were brought back by crusaders from Syria. And that's not all. They wanted to find the Magna Carta. And they found it on the 11th of September, 1217. But it had been changed. Now, the fifth chapter of Magna Carta provided in it estovers, provided the widows reasonable estovers in the common. Here's where we've got to do a little work. Estovers, what does estovers mean? I'll tell you in a minute. Not only was the big charter found, but a little charter came with it. And that little charter is a charter of the forest. And ever since, the two charters have gone together, like, two, like a big and a little sister. It's when Magna Carta got its name. Magna means big charter. But it's with the charter of the forest, which provided for panage for the common, provided for chiminage for the common. There's a whole nomenclature of the commons, of the forest commons. Estovers just means you can. See, back then they didn't, their hydrocarbon energy resource was not based on coal the way it was once in Pittsburgh. Their hydrocarbon energy resources was not based on oil the way it is for us. You couldn't. Your clothes, our furniture, our cars, our transport, our housing, even our food now with new fertilizers is based on this hydrocarbon energy resource of petroleum. But the robber barons at the time of Magna Carta, relied on wood. And so he took the woods of England to himself. And the commoners who used to use the woods, especially the female, the women of the Middle Ages, were central to the commons. And in fact, the women were central to commoning practices in England for the next centuries, right until the 19th. And you can still find this around the world today, where there's common. In North Korea, in Mexico, in Brazil, perhaps in Venezuela. Wherever there's common in Europe, in Nigeria, or in Kenya. There are several generations of English social historians, as people like me, students of Edward Thompson, who have described the criminalization of commoning, or have described the survival of commoning. And when you read it, it always seems 
like long ago or far away or cute or valuable for the heritage industry or some good way to help cause tourism in this or that parish of the olde England. You know what I'm saying? this common In 1940, the, in England, the picture post said, we believe that after the war, certain things will be common ground among all political parties. It will be common ground that every man, woman, and child felt shall be assured of enough food of the right kinds to maintain him in full bodily health and fitness. It will be common ground that we must reform our system of education so that every child is assured of the fullest education he can profit by. It will be common ground that our state medical service must be developed so as to foster health, not merely battle with disease. A new political party was started in England called the Commonwealth Party. Their slogan was common ownership. Woody Guffrey said, when there shall be no want among you because you'll own everything in common, when the rich will give their goods unto the poor, I believe this way, to own everything in common, Woody Guthrie said. Commons means all of us. This is old commonism. And in truth, the first translator of the English Bible, John Wycliffe, had translated Acts to verse 44, to have all things in common. A wording that has been kept in all subsequent renditions. And the early Christians had all things common as every man his need. Do you hear that? Can you hear in it Marx's later definition of communism to each according to his need? I'm talking here of a very old human ideal. But I'm also talking of a very old and very pervasive and very deep human practice. A practice of mutuality. And to understand that practice, we need to know words such as estovers. Because when practices have gone, the language describing them has gone too. And if we wish to reclaim a commons and reclaim human mutuality, we're not going to be able to do it in the old language of privatization. Mark, this sounds like time for five minutes. Is that all? Check something. <laughs> yeah, we'll manage. I guess there was a poem I wanted to read by Edward Thompson. How the old he night called a place called Choice, and he saw on the wall of the old handloom weaver, he saw shadows cast by the rushlight, shadows of previous strugglers parliamentary struggle like Ernest Jones, Luddite struggle like, like Mellor, Cartwright's Mill. All right. There's the heroes of the labor's past. But the rushlight, what's that? It's a blue flame caused by rushes. Rushes are reeds. You get them down by the river. You take off the bark. There's a pulp inside. You soak the pulp in animal fat and you have yourself a substitute for a candle. You can read at night. A light came from the commons. Do you follow? I'll explain to you in detail later then. <laughs> this is the way they made their light, is from rushlight candles. I wanted to quote this poem because 
When I went off to England to meet Edward, I read a book called The People of the Reeds. The people of the Reeds are, are at the cradle of civilization in Mesopotamia, aren't they? Between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And the wars of Bush and the oil wars, the grabbing for the hydrocarbon energy resources by the privatizers destroyed the people of the Reeds. So it's just a poetic link, do you follow? Between one commons in one part of the world and another commons in another part of the world. And how when we speak of the English history, it's not gone. The expropriations continue in our lifetime. And we see that with the, with the reeds. So that was one thing I wanted to put in. And then another thing I wanted to put in that might even be worth stretching our time a little bit, if I could beg your patience, is the freedom of want. Remember the four freedoms. Can we just have it? Everybody, do these four freedoms. Nobody's going to leave here without this test. Let's have a review. Freedom of speech. Freedom of religion. Freedom from fear. And freedom from want. OK, who's a student here? Come on, profs. Everybody. All right, we won't forget these four freedoms. All right, we could just, all right. Now, but what is this freedom of want? It's not Estover's panage. Panage is letting your pig go into the forest. It's not chiminage, that's using roads without having to pay a toll. It's not Estover's, that's being able to get some wood for your fuel. No, freedom from want, what is that? It's just, how do we translate it into food stamps, into health insurance, into subsidized housing? How do we translate it into uh, to our lives? It, an effort was made in the 1930s in our struggles. An effort was made in the 1940s to translate that commons into something through the state as a guarantee. And it was a man from the Philippines, Carlos Bulosan. Who's heard of him? I'd never heard of him until two weeks ago. He wrote the essay in the Saturday Evening Post in 1943 on the freedom from want. This man from the Philippines, who come at the age of 16 to America, to Seattle, then went up to Alaska to work in the cameras, worked in the factories of the fields, all up and down the West Coast, as a teenager, until he got tuberculosis, ended up in the hospital, became a writer, wrote a wonderful book called America is in the Heart, which I'll, I'll read in a minute, Oh, no, I won't read the whole novel. <laughs> he speaks for equal opportunity to serve themselves and each other according to their needs and abilities. That's Carlos Bulosan writing in 1943. You can hear the echo of Wickley. He, you notice he writes not of work or labor, but of service. He continues, but we're not really free unless we use what we produce. So he's not writing about possessions and gaining more, but what can be used. So long as the fruit of our labor is denied us, so long will want manifest itself in a world of slaves. We go back to slavery. When we have enough to eat, then we are healthy enough to enjoy what we eat. Then we have the time and ability to read and think and discuss them. We are the men and women reading books, searching in the pages of history for the lost world, the key to the mystery of living peace, imperishable joy. We are the factory hands, the field hands, the mill hands everywhere, molding, creating, building structures, forging ahead. We are the living dream of dead men everywhere, the unquenchable truth that class memories create to stagger the infamous world with prophecies of unlimited happiness. We are the living and the dead men everywhere. If you want to know what we are, we are marching. This is the explanation of freedom from want in 1943 by Carlos Bulosan. The immigrant worker, the agricultural worker, the despised work. The 
recognizes in the same essay the forces which have been trying to falsify American history. So I was trying to see what his life was like in the Philippines before he came as a proletarian to work in factories in the field. What was his relationship to Kamani in the Philippines? I've started that investigation. Yeah, he, he learned how to cut bamboo, stuff it with shrimps, wrap it in banana leaves, stick it in a fire. Delicious. He learned how to do that out in the commons, you know, without going to the mall, without going to the store. Back to Edward Thompson. Edward never talked about Magna Carta. He was sarcastic once about it. He said, let's imagine Christopher Hill, or he was, I better get the quote here. Ancient traditions may still, with careful management, be turned in for cash. Yeah. And why should not a few historians also be listed among the nation's assets? Yes, let Mr. Christopher Hill be seated behind a little glass alcove with an old black letter folio of Magna Carta. <laughs> Let's have Morris dancing on the lawn. <laughs> See, his sarcasm could be lacerated to get us all laughing. And that's where he referred to Magna Carta. But I think our task is to bring these subjects together, the Constitution and the Commons. And when Edward, in a more serious vein, against the secrecy state in 1978, talking against those people spying upon him, talking about those who are subverting the jury, talking about the subversion of habeas corpus, then he reflects more seriously on the Constitution and says that a Constitution is based in the culture of the people, but the culture of the people is changing, and we analyze that culture in terms of class relations. I think we need breakthroughs. 2008. Now, this, this is my conclusion. We need some breakthroughs. We need, we have the robber barons. It's not so much Frick that I've been thinking of, as it's Cheney, as it's Bush as it's the corporate mongers whose name I don't know, who are hoarding to themselves the hydrocarbon energy resources of our planet and using that monopoly It's not bad King John and his attack on Sherwood Forest but it's the attack on Central Asia through the balance of power, through the client states, through the petroleum states. This is where our destiny is. Tom Paine in 1776 called in common sense for an American Magna Carta. And the Declaration of Independence was the result. But it was a Magna Carta without its little sister. It was a Magna Carta without the Charter of the Forest. The Magna Carta has provisions in 61 for those who violate it, as habeas corpus trial by jury, due process of law, prohibition of torture have been violated. King John would had to lose all his possessions, all his lands, all his castles. Only his person and family would not be harmed. 
Are we ready to do that? The other theme I want you to remember, besides the commons, the four freedoms, is the theme of reparations. Magna Carta said that bad King John had to return to the commoners, not only the forests that he had taken, but those that his brother had taken, and those that his father had taken, and those that Henry I, his grandfather, had taken. So the reparations go back. Bad King John must pay. He must pay back what he's taken. And I wonder, are we ready for that? These were the thoughts that came to me in the pressure cooker after 2001, as I tried to battle that deliberate idealization of historical ignorance. And in taking you to 1940, I wanted to bring you to a crisis time when thinking could be our fighting. And I did this not so you could watch atonement. <laughs> I did it because I think this is our past for our future. We must reclaim the past because otherwise it too will be taken from us. We want the whole hog, the four freedoms and freedom from want, because otherwise we'll lose the earlier ones. Otherwise we'll have that slavery that Franklin Roosevelt prophesied for us when it became impossible to mention the four freedoms. I think we have a deeper task. Anyway. Oh, that's it. in the cloister area that wasn't there. But I, but I am sure that it is there this time, or at least so I hope. Uh, questions for Peter? Isaac? Sure. Um, you talked about a lot of the... Could, could you stand up? Yep, sure, of course. Speak up, please. Yep. Uh, you talked about a lot of uh, common resources that exist today that people fight over, whether it's subsidized housing, whether it's welfare. Um, for a lot of graduate students, and not just in Pittsburgh, but lots of places, graduate students and other occupations within the university adjunct professors are underpaid so severely uh, that many graduate students and adjunct professors have to rely on these same things to get by. And then graduate students or adjuncts who are immigrants are put in an even more underprivileged position, where there are many of these common resources aren't available to them. And so this is a place where these struggles over common resources and subsistence take place not just in the past and the present, but within the academy and the places that lots of us work and lots of us study. And so here at Pittsburgh, we have a department that's working for us with lots of these issues in the history department, but there are lots of students, graduate students at other universities, adjuncts here and elsewhere, who work and struggle with these issues and other, and other issues within the department and elsewhere, and at a university that invests in Sudan and does business with people who are operating in Darfur, and a university that does research with the military and that just recently held a conference to help discuss how to perpetrate war crimes more successfully and more effectively. And so I'm curious, the university provides this really interesting space, and especially for younger people and for undergraduates, where you get a chance to discuss and to think about all these things that are going on in the real world in the past and the present, and like you talk about, to apply these ideas that came from before to our own lives. So I'm curious as someone who spent a lot of your life in the university environment, what you can offer those of us whether it's graduate students, whether it's undergraduates, whether it's working people who do the street sweeping and the dishwashing and the cooking and answering the telephones in universities, what you see is the place of the university, both 
as a site of the kinds of social struggles you're talking about and the place that the university can play, the role that it can play in these struggles. Yeah, it's a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> it's a battle of, uh, I look at it as a, I mean, from my perspective, as a, uh, it's a battle of ideas. Yes, my brother, I think there's a battle of ideas. I'm, I don't mean to say that the struggle for subsistence is saying that in addition to a material struggle, there's also a battle of ideas. That's what I got out of the breakthroughs of 1940. Of course, the struggle continues. I used to belong to an organization that had the slogan, a free university and a free society. the way graduate students are organizing. I don't know enough about how the machine of knowledge is reproducing itself. But if at a public lecture in Pittsburgh, the first question is yours, well, it could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> To office perks or subsistence stuff. I'm not saying Estovers or Panage or Jiminich is going to be a direct help at the court of law. <laughs> it might be worth something in class or you know in late night discussions. Uh, I believe what's happened in the past can help us in the future. But you might say, well, you're a prof. Of course you believe that. And you're old. <laughs> but I think the burden of my lecture tonight is, you know, is to show that if you just live in the present, then there's a danger of a kind of isolation. You know, it's a, it's a class struggle. It's a struggle. I'm just giving a lecture. I'm sorry, I, I made, I'm sure there are many others in this hall who would have it better to help you with your <coughs> questions. I think university used to mean like it's related to universe. But you know, no, none of us go for that anymore. Like, then there's a, is it a factory? A fog factory producing ideological obfuscation. No, I don't think so. You know, there are people like yourself, there are, pe there are many here with open minds who are engaged in the battle of ideas, engaged in the critique of the university, engaged in the critique of the different disciplines that keeps labor history apart from everything else, from art. That's, that treats material life as different from spiritual life, that puts economics and business over there with tons of money. You know, there's, this is a struggle, but ideas, uh, I mean, I really, I got that from the 40s, you know, from Carlos Bulosan. These ideas are for us, and for you, they're for you. It's what Walt Whitman said, didn't he? The legacy of the ages, all for you. And it's, but it's our job to take it, to seize it, and then to think it, to make it. Yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, over here, question? You mentioned a similarity between the Robert Aaron and the Daddy Jobs. And our present uh, president was about to come out of the screen, but also nameless corporate owner. I feel the same way. But do you see any notable differences between back then and now? There's 
significant? I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think assassination is the way to go. Is <laughs> 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 it sorry? On the other hand, on the other hand, back then, if they get a new king, they'd open up the jails to show them this, this king was merciful. I wouldn't mind seeing a little more mercy in the justice system. How about every time there's a new president, the jails are open? That used to, how about every time, every 50 years, all the land is redivided again equally, as it says in Leviticus chapter 25? Let's give it a try. It worked for millennia. <laughs> So those are some differences. <laughs> Similarities, how many people bag a deer in hunting season? Yeah, so there's one or two. <laughs> when Marcus came here years ago, he said, Peter, hunting season, half my class disappears. Okay. Good shots, not good shots. <laughs> well, that's just... <laughs> Just back like to Frick. That would be a and they miss Frick, huh? That would be a similarity. <laughs> There's a sim Any more questions? Who was the lineage of King John? Where did he get his ideas from? I mean, what do you know? How far can you trace it back to the Normans? Yeah, well, he was wicked, and so were all the other members of his class. They were robbers, rapists, and thieves. They'd steal, each other. They'd steal women. They'd take your children hostage and, and kill them if you didn't pay up enough. That's what the robber barons did then. And it's not just wicked King John any more than it's just wicked Bush. If you want to look into the history, like England is a nation of such you know, mixed ethnicities, mixed peoples from all over the world. You know, there were black people in England long before there were white people. You know, because the, the Roman legions were there with their North African uh, long before the Angles came. If you want to read this history, you know, have a read uh, A.L. Morton's People's History of England. Morton. He's from that generation of, from the breakthrough of 1940. It's a classic book. It's good for you. I'd even have, uh, you know, see that very patient young person next to you. Um, I might even read Charles Dickens' A Child's History of England tour in the evening. You know, it has some excellent chapters on the early history of England. It's, you know, quite, quite good. Quite good. I mean, I'm not, I won't vouch safe it for being up to date with the latest research or interpretations, but it's, it's a good start for that early history of the Celts and the Romans and the Africans and all the different people who came to the British Islands and who are still coming. Daniel Defoe wrote a great poem about it, which I can't recite. <laughs> okay, I think we will uh, move to the reception. I would remind everybody that there are copies of uh, Magna Carta Manifesto. Uh, I think Peter normally says that you should go tell them to be one of the